As you start your programming journey, it's important that you really understand the basic building blocks of any program that is developed. The first thing we need to do is gain an understanding of what is happening when a program is running. And to understand that fully, we need to have a look at the insides of the computer and talk about two hardware components that are found on the motherboard. Now here is a picture, it's a, it's a snapshot and it's zoomed in of a part of the motherboard, which is the main board in a computer. Now on it you can see here there are four sticks of RAM and beside it this is called the CPU, the Central Processing Unit. So let's name them because we're going to be talking about them. So this one here is called the Central Processing Unit. And this here is called random access memory right so those are the two main players in this story of a program executing when you write program code the code that you write are instructions and they're instructions to this part of the computer system this central processing unit here is where all instructions are carried out. So let's write that in here. So all instructions are processed by the CPU, the Central Processing Unit. Now, the speed of the central processing unit determines how many instructions can be processed per second. And on an, on an up-to-date laptop, maybe of a speed of 4.2 gigahertz, what that means is your processing unit is capable of processing 4.2 billion instructions per second. So when we write our programs, and we're going to be using the Python programming language, it's called a high-level language because it's not written in binary, and that is all that the processing unit can understand. So let's put that in. So the, the CPU understands machine code, Right, and machine code is written in binary. So that means that when we write our program in Python, it needs to be translated into binary. So let's write that in. So Python programs need to be translated into binary code so that the CPU can understand it. Right. So that kind of gives you an idea that when we are creating Python programs, we need to think of how the computer is going to process it and write our instructions in such a way to help the central processing unit. Now, that takes us on to what we're going to be studying today, which is variables and the data types that you can store in variables. So, in order to discuss variables, we need to look at random access memory. Now, do you see on this RAM, there are black kind of things stuck to the circuit board? Now, those black things 
are called solid state memory. And what that means is the memory doesn't move, there's no moving parts in it. So let's put that in brackets, there's no moving parts. Now, one of the advantage of not having moving parts where you're storing your data is that it's much faster. And the other thing that makes it faster is the fact that it's so close to the central processing unit. When the central processing unit sends an instruction to RAM to fetch either an instruction or data that's been stored in these memory locations, it's only got a short distance to travel to reach the central processing unit, where a component in the central processing unit, let's just put it in that called the arithmetic logic unit, will carry out calculations and comparisons. Right, so back to this solid state memory. Let me change this. Now if we had to zoom in on this solid state memory, it would kind of look like that. It would kind of look like pigeonholes. And each pigeonhole, right, so lots of pigeonholes. And each pigeonhole can store a piece of data. And that's what we call these pigeonholes are what we call variables, right? So it's made up of two parts, the pigeonholes. So the first part is the address, location. Kind of like your house address, every house address in your street is different. So it's the same when you're asking the processor to access a piece of data it has to know exactly where it is in RAM. Look, there's four sticks around here. And this together in combination could actually be about 32 gigabytes of storage. So the address location and then this other side, this is where the data goes. Right? And the data needs to be, the computer needs to know what type of data is stored in here. Okay, so this is us getting to this data types part. So if I change my pen to orange, yep, orange, and if I put a circle around that, and then I see variables are memory locations. in RAM where the actual data is stored. So if you've got a program, say you're wanting to store the number 5 and you've created a variable called number, then this memory location while your program is executing represents your variable number and the value that will be inside it will be the number 5. Now, remember I said a minute ago that the processing unit had this arithmetic logic unit and that it carries out arithmetic, arithmetic calculations like add, divide, multiply, subtraction, modulus and power operations. It can't do that on text, so it can only do it on numbers. And the way it handles numbers with decimal points is different from the way it handles whole numbers. So that means that the data needs to be given a data type so that the processor knows how to handle it, how to um, calculate with it so that errors don't occur. Right, so let's have a look now at the actual data types. Data types. Let's have a look at these. So it turns out there are quite a few data types. So we've got string. That's a data type. 
There's another one called a uh, character. And there's another one called integer. There's another one called real. And there is another one. There's another one called Billion. So that's one, two, three, four, five data types. Right now, so that is what the computer can understand. It can understand these five data types and it can process data which is of type string, type character, type integer, type real and type boolean. So what is an example of a data type string? So let's do this. So data type string would be text. So for us, if I said the word hello, so the computer treats that as a string of characters where each of these is an individual character. And that brings us on to the next data type, which is an individual character. One character is a type character. And if you put more than one character together, then it becomes a string. Some people think of it as like a washing line. So here is your washing line. And you've got your rope. And pinned to your rope, you've got your characters. And that's where some people uh, get this analogy of a string, a string of characters strung out on a rope. Okay, so if that helps you to understand the difference between string and character, that's absolutely fine. Now, these two, uh, let's see, change that. These two, integer and real, are numbers, but one is whole numbers. So integers are whole numbers, which, so that's a number which doesn't have a decimal point, so the number five is an integer, the number 341 is an integer, where a real number has a decimal point. So it would be something like 5.0 or 5.14, anything which has a decimal point in it. And Boolean is the data type which takes up the least amount of space. It only needs a bit, one bit of space, which is the smallest um, size in a computer. And it's because it, it can either, it's said to be two state, it can either be true or false. It can't be both at the same time. True or false, capital T, capital F. And that's what Boolean is. So yes, no, male, female. Um, anything where there's two states, one or the other, that's what the Boolean data type is used for. So in programs, it could be, do you wish to continue? And the choices would be yes, no. If it's yes, the program will go on and, and um, execute more instructions. If no, then the program will terminate. So that takes us on to the next part where we'll actually look at how Python deals with data types. Now I've opened up Thony, which is a free um, development environment for Python programs. You just go to the Thony website and download it. When you open it, um, you've got two areas. The shell area with the chevrons is your scratch pad where you can test out code and above it is where you actually write your program code. As you write your program, uh, your program code will be given line numbers. You have to name your program and save it somewhere. So I've created a blank file at the moment. I've called it Program Data Types. You do the same. Save it in your SDD folder and then just work along with me. So 
What do we know so far? Variables are of different data types. So we're going to create a variable of each data type and see how that is done in Python. So the first thing that you do in your program always is put in a single line comment with your name. Now, a single line comment in Python is represented by the hashtag that I've just written there. I always like to put a couple of underscores just to make it more readable. Put in your name and then underneath it, put in the date. And the reason that you do that is because this is your program, you have created it, so it's your intellectual property. And also, um, when you're looking back over your programs later on, it's, you, you need to know what the program's about because you'll probably have forgotten. So to do that, you put in a multi-line comment, which is triple speech marks in Python. So that's the start of your multi-line comment. And this is the end of your multi-line comment. And remember, comments are there for the human, the programmer, to be able to read. But the actual computer, the processing unit, totally ignores this because it knows it's been instructed not to read this code and interpret it So, uh, because it's just there as notes for the programmer. So let's write down what this program is going to do. So this program will declare five variables. So that's all this program is going to do. And we will create a variable of each data type, just so that you can see what it looks like in Python. The first variable we'll call surname, and that's going to be of data type string. The second variable we'll call grade, and that will be data type character. The third variable we'll call mark, and that will be of data type integer. The fourth variable we'll call average, and that will be of data type real, which is stored as a floating point number in a computer. The fifth variable we will call has passed, and that will be of data type boolean, which is true or false. Right, so let's put some comments in to remind us of what's, what these are. Now, you always do that when you declare your variables. You always put a comment in on the same line, so it's a single line comment. And, it, and what you should do is say this is a string variable and it will store. And then you go in to see what it's going to store in the program. So for this one, it's going to store a pupil's surname. And then for grade, we're going to say this is a character variable, variable, and it will store a pupil grade, which can be A, B, C, D. So it's only going to need one character. Right, the third one is mark. I will put in our comment here. So this is a, an integer variable. And it will store a pupil mark. And average, you can see this is a real because it's got a decimal point, so this is a real variable and it will store the average mark. Now, when you're calculating average, say it's the average of five numbers, remember you have to add up the five numbers together and divide by five. Any time you do a division, then there's the possibility that there's going to be a remainder, which is why you have to 
reserve a real data type for that memory location, for that variable. Right, and the last one is a Boolean data type. It's a bo Boolean variable and it will store if the pupil has passed. So it's going to be true or false. They have passed or they have not passed. So this is what you should do at the start of your program. And the reason you do it at the start of your program before you actually start to put in any data is because you have to reserve the memory locations. You have to give the program a chance to instruct the processing unit to reserve memory locations in RAM so that as your program executes you can store values in your variables and you can go back to those variables and retrieve those values do calculations on them and update the values that are stored in those variables because they've been reserved in RAM while your program is executing when your program stops executing, when it stops running RAM, those memory locations that you've reserved, they'll just be freed up for other programs to use. So you don't need to worry about that. It's only while your program is executing that these variables point to memory locations in your RAM. So Python has a type function which you can use to find out what data type can be stored in a variable. All you have to do is put the variable into the type function. Let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to make this a bit bigger now so that we can see it. So in the program we've got this variable surname. Now if I didn't know what data type that was, I could type this line of code down here in the shell um, to declare that variable. So we've got surname is assigned speech marks and that's how you tell Python it's string. So if I want to find out what data type that surname variable is, I can say type and in the brackets put the variable name. And when I press enter, what's returned, um, Python has looked at this variable surname and it's decided that it's type str, which is short for string. Let's do it with grade now and see what happens. So grade, we've said grade has been assigned speech marks as well. So we'll say type grade. And again, it's coming back a string. So even although we've said grade is a character, because a character is one character of a string, they're both treated as string. Let's look at mark now. So mark is assigned zero and we've said that that means it's an integer so let's check and make sure if that's true uh, mark and it returns int which is short for integer uh, let's try average now so we said average is assigned 0, 0.0 and that's your setup your declaration of a floating point number a real number so let's type in here average, the variable name, and it's of type float. Remember I said that real numbers, numbers with a decimal point, are represented by a computer as a floating point number. And that's why that says float there rather than real. Uh, let's try this last one, has passed. So has passed is assigned true. Remember we've got to use the capital T for boolean and we want to type, find out the type of the variable has passed and it's returning bool which is short for boolean. So if you're not sure in your program you can always copy the line of code that um, declares your variable and then find out what type it is. Let's have a look at a program now and put this all together. So let's get some space and then have a look at the program. I've 
Fortunately, the programmer who wrote this program has given us some help by writing a multi line comment here to explain what the program does. So it says the purpose of this program is to store some personal information about the computer user. So that would be the person who was interacting with the program while it was executing. We've got three sections there's a declare variables, input data, and output results. You know, we can see how easy it is to understand this program because these comments have been added. In the declare variables section, you can see that there's one, two, three variables. One's called name, one's called favourite colour, and one's called number of hobbies. If the programmer had written a comment to say what data type the name variable was and what it was going to be used for in the program, that would have been very helpful. But we can see by these speech marks that this is a string data type that will be stored in the variable name. Also in favourite colour, see how that's got an underscore at it? That means this is one variable. And that's also going to be data type string. And number of hobbies, this is the usual way to write number when you're writing it as a, a name of a variable. And it's going to be data type integer. Right, so once these variables have been created, that means that the program is using three memory locations in RAM to store data. Now we're at the input data, and we can see that an input statement is being used with the assignment operator. So once the person has entered their name, whatever they enter at the keyboard, will be stored in the variable name. If we look at the output from the program, you can see here it says, Hi, please enter your name. And the user has entered Rupert. So that means that Rupert is being stored in the variable name. And if we look at the next line, it says, Hi, curly brackets, curly brackets, and at the end here, dot format name. This refers to the name variable. And we know that Rupert is stored in the name variable. So this reads, Hi Rupert, please enter your favourite colour. And if we look down here at the output from the program as it's running, it does indeed say, Hi Rupert, comma, please enter your favourite colour. You can see, so this these curly brackets are being used as a placeholder, a kind of template for the value. And number of hobbies is an input. Interestingly, because number of hobbies is an integer data type, a whole number, the input comes back as string. So we need to turn it into an integer before it gets stored in number of hobbies. And again, it's using this curly brackets as a kind of placeholder for the name variable. And if we look down here, it says, hi, Rupert. Please enter the number of hobbies you have. And Rupert has put in two. So the output, the next message, is a print statement. So it's not expecting the user to enter something. It's not an input, it's a print. And there is no assignment statement attached to it, no assignment operator, and no variable. So the program is not expecting a return value to be stored. It's just printing out, displaying to screen whoever's inside the print brackets. So it says, hi, curly brackets, your favourite colour is curly brackets, and you have curly brackets hobbies. And the format, we've got three variables, name, favourite colour, and number of hobbies. The first value inside the format brackets goes into the first curly brackets. The second value that's stored in this variable favourite colour is stored in the second curly brackets and the value that's stored in this third variable number of hobbies is stored in the third curly brackets and we can see that hi Rupert which is the value that was stored in the name variable your favourite colour is yellow which is the value that was stored in the favourite colour variable you have two hobbies and 2 is the integer value that was stored in the number of hobbies variable. When you see programs, it's very important that you try and read through them and understand what's happening in the program. Good.